On June 8, 2025, a Cessna 414, registration November 414 Bravo Alpha, crashed off Point Loma, killing all six on board. The aircraft had taken off from San Diego International under routine conditions, with an experienced pilot at the helm. So, what went wrong? Despite a clear departure and no immediate signs of trouble, the plane lost control just minutes into the flight. The recovery of debris and an oil sheen left a haunting question. How did this capable twin-engine aircraft go down so suddenly over water? Let's check it out. The flight began like any other. At around 12.30 p.m. local time, November 414 Bravo Alpha was cleared for takeoff from runway 27 at San Diego International Airport. Winds were light, visibility at ground level was fine, and the pilot received a standard departure clearance. Left turn to heading 180 after takeoff. Everything up to this point was textbook. After departure, the pilot checked in with SoCal approach, responded normally, and began climbing as instructed, but just minutes later, things went off script. As the aircraft climbed into the infamous coastal marine layer, a dense overcast layer sitting between 1,600 and 2,400 feet, its flight path suddenly turned chaotic. Radar data showed a sharp and unexpected 360-degree turn, followed by steep altitude loss. Moments later, the aircraft dove toward the ocean at a staggering descent rate, only to recover at just a few hundred feet above the water. Then, inexplicably, it climbed again, straight back into the clouds. This cycle repeated multiple times. The aircraft would climb into the marine layer, lose stability, dive violently, and then pull out just in time. One turn measured as steep as a 270-degree bank, with descent rates exceeding 10,000 feet per minute. These weren't just mild deviations. This was full-blown loss of control. From a stable climb to a roller coaster of near impacts and recoveries in under five minutes, the radar trail told a story of extreme disorientation or serious control issues. But the question is, was it the pilot, the aircraft, or both? When we listen back to the ATC communications with November 414 Bravo Alpha, the picture that unfolds is subtle at first. No shouting, no chaos. Just a slow, uncomfortable slide from routine to unraveling. Let's break it down, a few lines at a time. Turn Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, for sequencing, flight heading of 270, maintain at or above 7,500. 270, uh, at or above 7,500, 4 Bravo Alpha. American 23621, looking at the cloud coverage ahead, do you think uh, someone will be able to make it in VFR? Uh, it'll be tight, I doubt it for American 23621. This sets the tone. ATC is already concerned about whether the conditions are workable for visual flight. That's not a great sign, especially for a light twin about to fly into a marine layer. American 2361, thank you very much. Maintain 170 knots or greater to the final approach base. Contact San Diego Tower, good night. All right, 170 or greater to the final approach base. Switch to American 2361. Tower 3346, fly present heading, descend to maintain 5,000. There's a heading down to 5,000, Scout 3346. Contestant 4 Bravo Alpha, uh, American on final set. It's going to be probably unlikely that to be able to make it into VFR. Say your request. Uh, request to go IFR then, 4 Bravo Alpha. This is a key moment. The pilot listens, evaluates the conditions ahead, and makes the right call. Switch to IFR. That shows awareness and sound judgment, at least initially. Contestant 4 Bravo Alpha, roger. Just fly heading 270 at or above 6,500. I'll have the high park clearance here shortly. Uh, 270 at or above 6,500, 4 Bravo Alpha. Contestant 4 Bravo Alpha, vector sequencing, turn left heading 180. Left heading 180, 4 Bravo Alpha. Contestant 4 Bravo Alpha, just going to maintain 6,500. Just going to maintain 6,500, 4 Bravo Alpha. Still smooth, still responsive. ATC is actively managing traffic. The pilot sounds in control, but we're only a few thousand feet from the bottom of that cloud layer, and things are about to get more dynamic. Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, clear to San Diego Airport, your present heading, descend to maintain 6,000. Clear to San Diego, present heading, uh, 4,500, I mean 6,500, 4 Bravo Alpha. Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, present heading, descend to maintain 5,000 now. 5,000, 4 Bravo Alpha. That slip, 
4,500, I mean 6,500, may sound small, but it's the first crack, a sign of mental load increasing. He corrects himself quickly, but something is shifting. Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, turn right heading 290 and proceed and uh, join the localizer. Uh, 290 and join the localizer, 4 Bravo Alpha. And Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, which location are you set up for? Uh, the RNAV, okay, 4 Bravo Alpha. This is where the handoff starts showing complexity. The aircraft is not yet on final, and it seems there's a mismatch between the expected approach path and what the pilot set up for. The RNAV approach requires specific setup and awareness. Not the kind of thing you want to be double checking mid climb, mid haze. Princess 4 Bravo Alpha, Roger, heading 290, proceed direct to Vida, descend to maintain 5000. Clear direct Vida, descend to maintain 5000. Princess 4 Bravo Alpha. Princess 4 Bravo Alpha, turn left heading 270, direct to Vida. Uh, 270, direct to Vida, 4 Bravo Alpha. November 4, Bravo Alpha, heading of 250, intercept final. Uh, 250, 4, Bravo Alpha. Multiple heading changes, rapid descent instructions, this is a busy cockpit. The instructions themselves are not unusual, but given the cloud conditions, each correction adds a new layer of stress. And with no second pilot on board, all of this is being processed solo. November 4, Bravo Alpha, report established on the final search course. Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, you're not clear to yet. You're not clear for the approach yet. You maintain the 3,000. Are you established? I uh, maintain 3,000. I just uh, make my left hand turn, then I'm be on 4 Bravo Alpha. 4 Bravo Alpha, Roger. If the center maintain 3,000, join the final approach course, please. Let me know when you're established. The center maintain 3,000, 4 Bravo Alpha, and I'll let you know. We're now hearing signs of confusion. He's maneuvering, but not established. ATC corrects the earlier instruction. A small miscommunication, but it matters. The pilot confirms his left turn, but we're not seeing solid situational control here. Uh, 4 Bravo Alpha is established. Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha cleared, approach runway 27. Maintain your best force speed uh, as long as you can. Constantly turbulence intro 737. Best forward speed 4 Bravo Alpha. Southwest 410, turn right heading 240, intercept final. Right 240, intercept the final, Southwest 410. Twin Cessna 4 Bravo Alpha, contact San Diego Tower, good night. Over to Tower 4 Bravo Alpha. If you didn't know what was coming, this would still sound like a functional flight, but it's deceiving. He's been established, cleared to land, handed off, and yet, within minutes, the aircraft will be spiraling into the ocean. November 4 Bravo Alpha, Tower, you up? Yes, I am. 4 Bravo Alpha. 4 Bravo Alpha, verify you have, you're correcting, you have the field in sight? Yes, I have the field in sight. 4 Bravo Alpha. Okay, and that low altitude alert. November 4 Bravo Alpha, runway 27, clear land. 27, clear to land, 4 Bravo Alpha. And when the tower gives a low altitude alert, it's likely already too late. Or at the very least, the concern was real. This was a serious warning, not a formality. But then something strange happens. 4 Bravo Alpha, turn right, Charlie 6, contact ground. 4 Bravo Alpha, looks like you missed Charlie 6, next one, Bravo 7, left, expedite off, contact ground. Oh, Bravo 7. Okay, 414 Bravo Alpha, Lima Grand Taxi, Bravo Alpha, Alpha 2, hold short 27 at Bravo 4. Uh, Bravo Alpha, Alpha 2, and hold short 27 at Bravo 4. Hold short 27 at Bravo 4. Aqua 4 Bravo Alpha, traffic will hold in position, cross runway 27 at Bravo 4 to signature, Charlie Hotel. Bravo Alpha, cross the runway. Bravo Alpha, make the right turn on Charlie, and then the, your first left. Uh, right turn on Charlie, first left. Uh, four Bravo Alpha. Bravo Alpha, you're going through the apron. You're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to stay on the taxiway. That's the last thing we could hear from the pilot.
The November 414 Bravo Alpha crashed offshore, and the final confirmed communication was the runway clearance, followed by radar data showing a final climb, sharp bank, and fatal descent. Now, what we're left with are a competent-sounding pilot making appropriate requests, receiving vector after vector, appearing to comply, but possibly never truly in full control. No mayday was called in this transcript, no emergency declared, but the radar and physical outcome tell us otherwise. Something went terribly wrong, even if the words never showed it. The leading suspect? Spatial disorientation, plain and simple. The pilot flew into a marine layer sitting between 1,600 and 2,400 feet with haze and open water below. That's a visual vacuum. And in those conditions, even seasoned pilots can lose their sense of balance and orientation within seconds. Now, don't get me wrong, the pilot did the right thing requesting IFR, but something clearly went wrong after entering the clouds. The aircraft made sharp turns, extreme climbs, and rapid dives. That's textbook disorientation. Your body says the plane is level, but the instruments say otherwise. And if you don't fully trust the gauges, you spiral fast. Could there have been more to it? Possibly. A malfunctioning autopilot can absolutely worsen things. If it was on and misbehaving, or if the pilot was fighting it, that could have triggered confusion or overcorrection. But we didn't hear him mention any control issues to ATC. Other ideas like a CG shift or runaway trim? Technically possible, but unlikely. There were no distress calls, no mechanical warnings, no I'm losing pitch moments, just quiet struggle. Bottom line, this looks like a classic case of situational overload. The pilot lost awareness, likely due to spatial disorientation, maybe worsened by automation, maybe not. Either way, the signs were all there, just not said out loud. There's a reason pilots don't just talk about the marine layer, they respect it. And in this case, it wasn't just about what the pilot couldn't see, it was about how fast conditions could degrade without warning. The thing about the marine layer is that it doesn't look threatening. It's thin, low, and familiar. Pilots in California see it all the time. But what makes it dangerous isn't just its depth. It's the way it creates a false sense of security. One moment you're flying in good visibility with the coastline in view, and the next, you're fully enveloped with no natural cues and nothing but ocean below. Unlike over land, where terrain, lights, or roads might offer some reference, the marine layer over water offers zero feedback. That's what makes it such a trap. It's not just IMC, it's disorienting IMC with no margins. In other words, if you're not already perfectly trimmed, perfectly stabilized, and perfectly locked into your instruments, you don't get a second chance to figure it out. And this isn't about bad judgment, this is about subtle vulnerability. Even pilots who train regularly can underestimate how quickly a thin marine layer combined with low visibility and workload can erode situational awareness. What we saw in this crash wasn't a failure to plan, it was a failure to regain control once the margin disappeared. Now, we're still waiting on the NTSB to tell us what really happened, but even now, a few things are already clear. First, the environment mattered more than it seemed. That thin marine layer, it may have looked harmless, but it created the perfect conditions for disorientation, especially over water where there are no visual anchors. Second, this wasn't a case of silence from the cockpit. The pilot was in constant communication, following instructions, even correcting himself when needed, which makes the loss of control that much more unsettling because it means disorientation can creep in without sounding like panic. And finally, it's a reminder that transition moments matter. Climbing through layers, switching to IFR, managing automation, these are the points where workload spikes. If anything was off, even slightly, that's where it could have spiraled. We don't know the full story yet, but what we're seeing so far is a powerful reminder to check your margins, stay current, and never take coastal IMC lightly, not even for a short flight. 